Thank Welcome, everybody. Thank oh, you yes. for coming to the Brattleboro Democracy Forum. Every Wednesday, every second Wednesday of every month here at the Strolling of the Heifers. We so much appreciate being able to be here. Uh, today, Nick Fiddle will be uh, presenting. And Nick is here today to present uh, the Pentagon, the Green New Deal, and taxes. Thanks so much. Thanks wow. everybody for showing up on this beautiful day. Um, so I've changed the title to Money, the Pentagon, and Survival. Okay, sorry. <laughs> it's catchy. Uh, so money, let's start with money. Those of us, and all of us are old enough now, as I look out, uh, to remember when money was based on gold. The gold standard that the Bretton Woods Agreement of 1944 uh, created, and I, you know, it's fun to think that Bretton Woods was, you know, negotiated in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire in July of 1944, one month after D-Day. So, what, the point I would make there is that Franklin Roosevelt and Churchill had so much confidence after D-Day that they started creating the whole financial future a month later. And until August 15, 1971, 35 US dollars got you one ounce of gold across the world. All the currencies on the, on the world were based on the dollar. And the dollar got you an ounce of gold at $35. That ended in 1971 with Nixon proclaiming the end of the gold standard because the United States' debt relative to fighting the war in Vietnam was getting excessive and he couldn't, didn't have enough gold, so he just blew it off. And since that day, the whole globe works on fiat con uh, currency, demand currency, fiat currency. And <clears throat> what is what is fiat currency? It's, it's, it's money or pieces of paper that the, that the government that you live under prints. And it, so if you take out, I'll take out this dollar right here. And on that dollar in the top left corner, it says this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. Great. Now, the, the funny thing about it is, what is this dollar worth? Well, inherently, it's a piece of paper. It's very special paper, that's for sure, because it's hard to uh, imitate these things um, because of this paper. But the funny thing is, this piece of paper says the same thing. It says this, has this note. This note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. Piece of paper, two of them. This one is worth 20 of these. Inherently, not. But because we believe that it is, and because we're so practiced at exchanging everything that we do on this basis, it works. The system works. And when we look at our own lives and how we manage ourselves and we buy the goods and services that we need, we depend upon these dollars, and we get, you know, we'll say 2,000 of them a month, and we cut and splice those for the goods and services that keep us alive. <laughs> and when we buy $2,500 worth of goods in a month, because almost always we do, we take out our plastic and put it on credit and pay that back later. And since we're in Vermont, we like to think, because we go to the Vermont town meeting and we watch how we squirmish over uh, school budgets in endlessly um, and how much tax revenue the town's going to take and and then we fight over that tax you know and how much of the school's going to get and then the rest to clean the streets and so forth and it it seems in fact it is very much the way that we organize our households we receive tax money we have an x amount of it we distribute it according to what we need and so we have this sort of habit here in Vermont particularly, but I think this is true across the, the nation, of thinking the government 
works much like our household economy. We have earnings, savings, credit. Governments have earnings, that's called tax revenue. Those are like, aggregated, they're distributed. And when the government spends more than the tax revenue, then it borrows from itself, right? That's its debt. And presumably, it will pay that back with a tax surplus in a future year. Is that not, is that, that's how we think it's happening, right? That, we're told that that's the way it's happening. Now, look at that handout that I, I gave. I think everybody's got one. Um, and this comes from the website at the top called uh, tradingeconomics.com, U.S. government. This is 19, I mean 2018 figures from 2018. I've highlighted or darkened the ones that I want to look at. <laughs> government spending, government revenues. Okay, now before you look at that, look on the right column. It says USD billion for government spending, USD million for government revenues. Now, Here's the, here's the first question for the, the, the quiz. How many, how many billions does it take to make one trillion? A thousand. A thousand. Okay, so here we have government revenues, 228,000 you know, million, 811, 211,000 million. That's to say, 228 billion, 811 million. Okay, that's government revenues 2018. Government spending in billions, 3,000, that's otherwise known as trillion, which is to say this is 3.2 trillion government spending with a revenue of 229 billion, which is to say government revenues are less than 10% of what the government spent. Less than 10%. That's a lot of deficit. That's a lot of borrowing. If you look across the, 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 the line for government revenues, <clears throat> it says previous revenue, 167, highest, 510 billion, lowest, 300 or 33 billion. So this is across 20 years, these highest, lowest, and previous. That means that this has been going on with a high of revenue of 510, that's to say one half trillion dollars, and a low of 33 billion for over 20 years. While the government spending at 3.2, 3.7, 3. down to 1. Point trillion has been going on at the same time. So if you look up at government debt, where, where it looked down actually below government revenues. What's the current debt? 2018. It's 22 trillion. 22 trillion. <clears throat> or government debt to GDP. And this is an interesting statistic because it doesn't tell us what GDP is here. But GDP is well, government debt is 105 percent of GDP. So I know, doing the research, the GDP, you can, if you do the math, is, in 2018 was $21 trillion, roughly, plus or minus, a little bit more. GDP meaning oh, the, the, the value of everything produced. Wax, $21 trillion, of which the government spent $3.7 trillion, constituting about 16% of, of GDP. That's how they like to play with the statistics. But the important part here is the revenues versus spending. and that this is an ongoing reality that's part substance of our, our existence. Nevertheless, we have this amazing uh, habit of the Republican Party to scream about government deficits. And again, for those of us, all of us in this room rather, we'll remember, maybe we won't remember as specifically as I do, but do you remember when government deficits became a political rallying cry? Lee, you nod your head. When? In the 80s? In the 80s. Yeah. Yeah. With Reagan. who? Reagan. With Reagan. I remember, almost remember, the, I remember the first time, because it made the Republican National Campaign made a big to-do about it. There was, there still is, too, the digital um, billboard, and I 
think it's on Fifth Avenue, it's somewhere close to the Plaza Hotel, um, that has the debt racking up. You know, so every second you see, you know, twenty-one trillion turning into twenty-one trillion two hundred thousand. You know, and so forth like that, made to scare us clearly. So Reagan becomes president, and we'll remember his most famous line, <clears throat> government is not the solution, it's the problem. And, and that, that sailed him into office uh, based on this sort of pseudo-populist indignation. And as soon as he's in office, he starts talking about Cadillac welfare queens a heck of a racist trope, really, and how they deserve their comeuppance. And <clears throat> so what does he do? He slashes social spending, and he, he politicizes this, propaganda upsizes this, is cutting the deficit. We've got to cut the deficit. So we've got to slash social spending, and these welfare queens deserve to go out there and get a, an honest job. And it, and it worked. The American people were all for it. Not all of them, not, not here in this room, but too many of them. And along with that, our B-movie actor for president started talking about Star Wars defense. And you'll remember what that is. That's you know, shooting ICBMs out of the sky, out of space, with, and it was never quite clear, lasers, or other missiles, and I remember the concept of it was a missile, it had to be like a bullet hitting a bullet at you know 48 miles above the earth, right? That you had to, that was what the science of it was. The scientific world knew immediately this was a pile of crap. But the American people loved it. And who were these missiles gonna go after? Why it was Star Wars, so of course we were fighting the evil empire. Boom, Star Wars, evil empire. It all worked, and the propaganda slid right on through. So what did that do? Defense spending went up 40% in six years, 40%. And then another little trope that comes smooking out is trickle-down theory, trickle-down economics. Oh, we're going to have this wonderful economy because we're going to rob the middle class and give it to the rich. Tax cuts for the rich. And the rich are going to be so generous with their money that everybody's going to benefit. And so we had trickle-down theory, Star Wars defense, and social spending cuts behind this president who claimed that he was here to cut the deficit. And instead, at the end of Reagan's presidency, the deficit was three times what it had been before he walked into office. <clears throat> now, those of us who lived during the Reagan period, and again, that's all of us, um, I keep hoping there's somebody younger than 60 in here, but that's not the case. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, we, we remember, uh, you know, how tough it was to live through those uh, those times. And, you know, it's not just the hypocrisy, it's the lies, the mendacity of Reagan that was so stunning. Just, I mean, and, and I, I became a Latin American historian because of the terror he unleashed on Central America in the 80s, and the American people denied it or refused to accept it. How many thousands of innocent people were slaughtered through his terror? And we just, American people sat here. And finally, there was Iran-Contra. And Ali North and his gang of, of criminals, all convicted for conspiracy and lying. John Poindexter, Ali North, Elliot Abrams, Elliot Abrams Robert McFarland, Richard Seaford, Casper Weinberger, Secretary of Defense, all convicted for lying and conspiracy. And none of them got more officially than probation. And then along comes the vice president into president, W.H., the senior Bush, and he pardons them all. First thing he does, like Ford getting in the office and pardoning Nixon. And, and again, we sit here stunned 
at the evil. But you know, the mainstream media all along is spinning this mystique of, of Reagan, the, you know, the, the heroic cowboy. Um, he's the gipper. Uh, and you know, damn, if he didn't make America great again. He's the one who put patriotism back into our culture. Patriotism first, the consequences be damned. And you know, America loved it. They bought it. I mean, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to fight. Um, you know, it aligns with all the main interest groups. What politician doesn't want the constituents to be patriotic? <laughs> Uh, what person on a New York Stock Exchange doesn't want the same thing? What person in the military? So it just, it's an easy sell, the patriotism. <clears throat> and one of the consequences is people like us, from that point forward, that's to say, with critiques, critics of the status quo, have had to stand up and, you know, demonstrate a large quantity of bona fides, of, of, of you know, legitimacy, before we even get to start talking about what's going on. Because if I start critiquing the U.S. government straight off, and I'm not in Brattleboro, then there are people who are going to say, oh, he's just a damn left, and get him out of here. That's America. Um, and the thing that's most difficult to criticize is the military. And it's extremely difficult to get the bona fides to criticize the military. But all of us, again, will remember, although very few of us might have been there at the moment, watching on television on the 17th of January, 1961, when President Eisenhower gave his farewell address and named, coined the term military-industrial complex, and said this, along the way in his speech, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. <laughs> We, must, we should take nothing for granted. What do you think? Any uh, misplaced power around? Any threats to our liberties, democracy? Da, 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 da. Where do you begin? Where do we begin? Well, back to the Pentagon and the budget that, that Reagan was so successful at inflating and turning into a sacred cow. Since too many Americans have, you know, have, have sort of purchased or wrapped themselves, embraced the myth of Reagan, uh, we've overlooked the contradiction between hyper-defense spending <coughs> and deficit, <coughs> and deficit fear-mongering. So we still, we kind of blanch when politicians get up and say the deficit's too, too big. We're, here we are going, oh, yeah, oh, and you know, it sure as hell is. What's going on? <laughs> and nevertheless, Eisenhower said what he said, nobody did a thing. Not, it didn't change a thing. And, and then, you know, all the way, fast forward to, to September 10, 2001, the day before 9-11. And Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, is speaking to the Pentagon. And he's angry. And he says, <clears throat> Some might ask, how in the world could the Secretary of Defense attack the Pentagon in front of its own people? He asked rhetorically. I have no desire to, to attack the Pentagon. I want to save it from itself. <laughs> what was he saving? Money. We cannot track $2.3 trillion in acquisitions, he remarked. $2.3 trillion. Okay, keep in mind now, how much is the U.S. government recovering in taxes every year? I don't know, 230 billion, somewhere in there. 2.3 trillion, over 10 times that amount. Can't find it. 
but the next day was 9-11. And boom, you know, all that's out the window. And we've been on the war and terror ever since. So then, 15 years have gone by. And in those 15 years, the Pentagon's defense budget has gone up from $315 billion to $600 billion in 2015. $600 billion, constituting about 4% of GDP. Now, long and lo and behold, at the end of fiscal 2015, this letter gets published from the Inspector General of the Department of Defense, July 26, 2016. I've underlined the most important words. We're providing this report for review and comment. Review and comment. Blah, blah, blah. The Army and Defense Finance Account Service, quote, did not adequately support $2.8 trillion in third quarter adjustments and $6.5 trillion in year-end adjustments made to the Army General Fund during fiscal year 2015 financial statement compilation. What does that mean, did not adequately support? There you go. What is an adjustment? An adjustment is how accountants record transactions. So what did, you know, what, this is the way uh, Rumsfeld put it. <clears throat> According to some estimates, we cannot track 2.3 trillion in transactions. So whenever there's a transaction, that's when the Pentagon sends out money and gets a bomb or you know 50 nurses or whatever, you know, goods and services. That's a transaction. So <clears throat> when the Pentagon cannot financially support 6.5 trillion in adjustments, that means transactions. That means there's $6.5 trillion floating around unaccounted for, completely unaccounted for, $6.5 trillion. That's in the Army budget. The Army budget was $120 billion, which constituted 6 or 2% of the full U.S. government budget of 2015, $120 billion. And with $120 billion, somehow or other, they could spent $6.5 trillion without a receipt. <laughs> and the government just notes it, takes note, called for a, uh, they actually did call for a full audit for 2016 that was completed in 20, July 2017. And the first line of the audit, uh, results of this audit failed. Not an individual was castigated, nothing, nothing. What, 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 what is really going on, right? Um, too much is going on. So how do we explain that, that nothing is going on in, re in relationship to this, that nobody is, is saying a word, that, that we can, you know, what, how, and to, to explain that, I think we should we need to get take a, a step back to World War II. In World War One, you know, there was a lot of uh, uh, a lot of propaganda about you know being patriotic, and, and, and we have billboards that we like. And one of the, the phrases was "loose lips sink ships." Everybody probably remembers that that common phrase. Um, in World War Two, it wasn't just loose lips. In World War Two. Uh, there was this thing called the atomic bomb. And you know, in 1939, uh, um, uh, Einstein wrote a letter to, to Roosevelt in, uh, I think it was October 39, detailing his knowledge of the German research into nuclear weaponry. And that started the, what we now call the Manhattan Project. And from 1939 to 1945, Franklin Roosevelt secretly without telling Congress, without telling the American people, without telling his vice president, he ran this thing called the Manhattan Project. From 39 to 42, it was done in laboratories in Chicago and Berkeley primarily. And then in 42, it was moved to Los Alamos, uh, New Mexico, and the actual production of an atomic bomb started. 
And Roosevelt sequestered secretly out of government budgets the money, roughly $2.3 trillion over uh, the course of World War II to build the bomb secretly. That's the first time that we know of a US president taking money out of the piggy bank and not telling Congress. <laughs> that was unfortunate. But secrecy around the bomb, I think we'll all sit here and say, probably legitimate. And there's one book I have in my library that claims that Roosevelt wrote a speech that he intended to give on you know, it's Jefferson Day, which is April 15th uh, in, in every year. Jefferson Day, 1945, in which he was going to talk about and explain that the United States was on the verge of having an atomic bomb, and everybody better learn that this is impossible for humans to control, so we're going to divulge the science and get rid of it and make sure that nobody ever does this again. And he died three days before he gave the speech. But he died. And with his death, several months later, Truman, giddily, I mean giddy, he was giddy. All, all the descriptions of the way Truman responded when he finally learned of the atomic bomb was a kid in the candy store. Oh boy, oh boy, I'm going to win World War II. And so there was no question about using it in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which he did weeks after he learned about it after the first successful test. And then the war ended, and then, and then the aftermath. And it's in the aftermath that we really have paid the price. Because maintaining a nuclear armament, keeping it ready for use in, by air, by missile, by sub submarine, all of that is a set of secrets that really none of us really would like the common man to have it. <coughs> and so we give, we give authority to the U.S. government to hold those secrets. And with the 1947 National Security Act, there is something that was established called the National Security State, delineating who gets access to these secrets, et cetera, et cetera. And with the National Security Act, a whole slew of organizations Cold War espionage organizations got started, most prominently the CIA. And from that day forward, from that moment forward, we've lived under this national security state in which it's totally illegal for you and me to know a whole slew of information, including the budget of the CIA including where that 6.5 trillion that the, the, the Defense Department went. Where does that come from? Who did what with it? We're not allowed to know. And we sit here with that kind of absence of accountability, which is primarily the greatest attack on our democracy. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Dick Cheney, uh, was uh, talking to Fox News in uh, year 2008, defending Bush and his bullshit, and um, pointed out the president could launch the kind of devastating attack the world has ever seen. He doesn't have to check with anybody. He doesn't have to call the Congress. He doesn't have to check with the courts. We sit here mutely underneath this absolutist state. And it's totally illegal. The National Security Act is a proclamation that, that gives the power to the executive authority that the Constitution prohibits. And nobody's ever followed up on that. Congress has never looked at that and never proclaimed that they've just lost their ability to control the president. And the first most important thing that the Constitution gives to the president and to Congress is the authorization for money, for the creation and distribution of funds. And it says Congress, and only Congress, shall have the power to declare war, to raise and support armies, but no appropriation of money to that use 
shall be longer than two years. Mm -hmm. Section 9, Article 1. No money, no money shall be drawn from the Treasury, but in con consequence of appropriation made by law. And a regular statement and account of receipts and expenditures of all public money shall be published from time to time. Mm -hmm. That's one avenue in which the Pentagon is unbelievably anti-constitutional and illegal. The other component is what the CIA really does. It's the, uh, you know, the covert crap. Um, National Security Order 95412, which I'm looking for because I want to quote it. Um, come on, baby. States that the United States, I'm not, I'm going to say it without having it, well, I'll find it, that the United States shall commit sabotage, subterfuge, and assassination against hostile states. Ah, uh, there we go. Let me quote it again, exactly. Sabotage, anti-sabotage, demolition, and subversion against hostile states. National Security Directive 5412. Also, any U.S. government responsibility for these actions must be made not evident. And if uncovered, the U.S. government must create a plausible ability to disclaim any responsibility for them. Who's saying this? National Security Directive 5412. But who do they give that to? <laughs> That's the National Security Council. I know, but what power do they have to say this is what we're doing? <laughs> who they gives don't. them that? They don't. It's not legal. It's like me <clears throat> standing up and saying, everyone owes me no, $500,000. The <laughs> it's practice. It's the same practice as why you spend these and everybody. So Congress them. never sees it. Huh? So Congress never sees it. Either. The what? The Congress, Congress never sees Congress it. Congress sits mum, you know, mum. But they don't even see it. Well, well, they don't see it, but this is a public document. They see it now. Oh. This was public. I mean, National Security Directive 5412 dates to 1951. But where does it come out and go to? Who gets it that? It's in the government records, National Security Archives. You can go find it. I did. It's well, I know, find. but when, when that's written, who does it go to? Do they just put it in it a little folder? It goes the to the president. The president directs it to the CIA and to the Defense Intelligence okay. So it really doesn't go to the public unless you go to the archives Of course not. This it. is part of the CIA. This, okay. is, this is his national okay. security state. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, our silence in the face of this, and Congress's silence, is, it's sort of it's like a demonic blind faith. You know, we have demonic blind faith that that no matter what our government does, in all of its criminality, from the destruction of the Nicaraguan people to lying to us about every damn thing it does, it's still a wonderful government. I remember Reagan, even the United States, and. I'm going to get $2,000 next month. I got $2,000 last month. I'm going to get $2,000 a month from now. I'm going to buy enough rent, food, clothing, <coughs> and transportation to have a decent life. Who's getting that? I'd like some. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. you got to go to Ecuador. Um, and, and I live thinking that, and I live thinking that will be true five years from now. And these two blind faiths, one in the government and the national security say, giving the power to the U.S. government to do its unbelievable evil, and then our blind faith in money. They overlap. They enable this whole thing to keep going. And, you know, uh, changing the mindset, the public mindset, you know, if, if all of a sudden we stop thinking money is going to not work, uh, you know, that could be a little dangerous, um, who knows? But something else is now in front of us, and that's global warming and environmental catastrophe. Uh, 
And when we look at it and we compare it to the origins of the national security state, which is nuclear bombs, and our fear of nuclear bombs legitimate are that if launched, all life is extinguished. But now we know on a daily basis that life is almost extinguished already. On Monday, headlines across the globe, you know, a million species are near extinction. That's one, you know, that's 18% of all life on Earth. Today, Washington Post, nothing in today's headlines compares to the coming catastrophe. Finding out that a million species face extinction without a radical collective change in human behavior is akin to finding out you have a fatal disease. One day you have a thousand problems, then you learn about that disease, and now you only have one. <laughs> that's true. That's where we sit. That's where we're at right this second. And, and so we have to re be ready to face this and do what it's going to take to survive. Because if we don't, we won't. I mean, everybody talks about 10 years, 15, 12 years. You know, Greta, Greta, Greta Thunberg is out there doing her good work. She uses the 12 year period. Um, she just got, I mean, I think it's not that she did it, but on, on the heels of her speech to the English Parliament last week, Parliament on May 1st declared a climate and environment emergency, global climate and environment emergency. National. National emergency, first national government to state it in those terms. Three days before, Spain had elections and the socialists won, and their platform was a, a global Green New Deal. Things are marching ahead. Yeah. Bill McKibben, our, our favorite, favorite son, wrote an article on the 2nd of May pointing out that you know England has called for a national climate and environmental emergency. Spain is calling for a global Green New Deal. Maybe, finally, humans are starting to get it. And I think, you know, I think back on my childhood, and, I, and my father was a, he fought in World War II, and I grew up with the World War II everywhere um, in my life. And, and, you know, even as a kid, I became interested, because movies, Hollywood used to have all these World War II movies, and you, you know, you'd see Nazis stopping um, cars, you know, in the middle of the street and demanding papers, like the your ideas, you know, and you know, and every now and then one out of every four people would be taken away and shot. And I, and I think, and then, you know, I became more of a historian as I got older and I read a lot of newspapers of the 1930s. And, and you know, headline after headline looks like this, right, 38. We have Austria submitting, Kristallnacht in, in, in Germany. 39, the invasion of Poland. Almost immediately, the Blitzkrieg throughout Europe. And what does America do? No, no, not happening, no. Jews in Poland, forget about it. Tyranny of Hitler, forget about it. There was a, there was a, it's insane. But the head of the SS, the second in command of the SS, threw a party in the Waldorf Astoria in New York four days after Poland was invaded. And who was there? The chair of Texaco, the CEO of General Motors, etc., to celebrate the coming global trade that the Nazi empire was going to create for U.S. corporations in New York City, Waldorf Astoria. That's where the United States was. That was 1940. It takes the United States a long time to wake up. I mean, you know, it, the, United States, the government of the United States didn't enter World War II until December 41. 
The war started in September 1939. It was World War, blood in the streets for two and two years and three months. And the United States sat around pretending it wasn't happening. So we don't have, as a people, a good record. The world is waking up, and it's, you know, as soon as we get our act together, we will too. But the way we have to do it is we have to recognize a couple things. We have to recognize that the national security state is illegal, a fraud, and <laughs> needs to go. Because nuclear bombs are secondary to what's going on. And all of the lies that our government runs under cannot be sustained. That's not going to be an easy thing to do. The other thing that's going to be difficult is facing these Republicans and their deficit bullshit, their deficit fear mongering. We know that it's crap. And, <clears throat> and yet, you know, how do you speak about it clearly? So Bill McKibben writes an article on the 2nd of May, and he says, you know, things are happening. So maybe, maybe, maybe the world can save itself. And <clears throat> this is his quote. It will be hard to achieve, he said. What uh, It will be as hard as, say, the retooling of the American economy to fight the Second World War. There we go. Okay, let's think about that. In 1940, the U.S. government spent on defense 10% of GDP for defense in 1940, when the Waldorf Astoria was hosting the Nazis. World War II began. <coughs> 1942, defense spending constitutes 45% of GDP. 45% of GDP through World War II. And then World War II ended and everything was golden. That was the best period economically in America's history. So the deficits didn't have a problem. They didn't create, in fact, they ended the depression. Well, from our first sheet here, we know that in 2018, the, the GDP was $21 trillion in the United States. If we tooled up our government to fight climate change, to have a climate and environmental emergency struggle, 45% of GDP would be $9.45 trillion. When you hear the Global New Deal figures, people say, oh my God, it's gonna cost $3 trillion. When Bernie stands up and says, we gotta get rid of college debt. Oh my God, it's $1.2 trillion. Et cetera, et cetera. Two things, keep in mind. The Pentagon misspent $6.5 trillion. Nobody said a word, but we got the documents. And two, this is life or death. This is life or death. And America did it once. They did it in World War II. If we don't do it, our grandchildren, our children will never reach our age. Thank you. I have a question. So let's get rid of the national security state. If it's founded on things that they just made up, how do you go get rid of things that are made up? Who do you go to when it seems like it was just out of nowhere that it came? Well, you know. The social movement for um, climate fighting, you know, for, for the climate emergency will require overturning the basic running of the U.S. government. There's no way that it will, that Exxon, the whole of the Pentagon is a carbon dependent reality. You can't fly jets, you can't build bombs, you can't launch satellites without Exxon, without Texaco, et cetera. So getting rid of the carbon economy means getting rid of the national security state. And so we must stop fighting wars against people using oil and start building solar panels to save species for our grandchildren. 
And that's a, that's a social movement. That's what we have to do. That's the only thing we can get to do. And when we do it, we will destroy the national security state along the way because there's no justification for it. All right, and my second question. If money is no longer based on gold, what is it based on? Your habits. I agree, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I know. It's <laughs> <laughs> But that's what it's based on. It's based completely on. So it's the all The government is saying this yeah. is yeah. legal tender. The government says this is legal tender. You accept it. You accept that one, that one of these or 20 of these, even though it's the same piece of paper. As long as you keep doing that, that's fine. Yeah. So John, I read some way at 118 last night. Um, okay, so, I wasn't there. Oh, okay. So John Erickson last night talked about the new Green Deal um, and its application in Vermont. But one of the things he also said was that the Department of Defense is are total believers in climate change and that they are investing heavily in uh, research, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, we are still spending almost as much as we did in World War II as a percentage of our budget on these 18, you know, 800 bases around the world and all of these small, and now, the revitalized nuclear arms race. So what's the best way to support the Department of Defense in shifting to? You know, I don't think we have to worry about that. I mean, the Department of Defense well, I mean, is playing its games, is playing its propaganda. And, and yeah, they're mostly worried about how they're going to control populations right. as, right. as migration right. occurs. Migration. So you know, that's, you know, that's their. That's their focus, um, and so they admit that global warming is real because they're already having to deal with all these population transfers. But, but it's the ending of war based on carbon economy. Carbon economy, war depends on the carbon economy. Huh? But we just found more in the Arctic. That brings the new state closer. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I know, and this, this is not going to, you know, think about the Soviet Union. In 1988, you know, the evil empire was running on all cylinders. We were, you know, if you remember, I mean, I was you know, still teaching stuff to, to undergraduates going like, can you imagine the end of the Cold War? I can't, literally. Um, and then 1989, the whole thing just collapsed. You know, and the Berlin Wall falls, and nobody's shooting each other. And why? Chernobyl. Chernobyl, I mean, a whole lot of things. No, it's a nice thing. It's the failure of the system. The total failure of the system. We're at the failing of our system. The humans on Earth are not taking it anymore. Sudan, all around the world. People are fed up. Finally, network, the movie network. We'll get, we're opening a window, putting our heads out. I ain't fed up, I can't take it anymore. That's happening. And we've got to continue to, to, to grow that truth grow that movement. And when we do, we've got to be very clear that the whole carbon economy is based on, on control, domination, and war. And war requires a carbon economy. So getting rid of the carbon economy gets, means getting rid of war. Why do we fight in Iraq? Oil. Why do we fight anyway? Oil. Forget about it. It's not, it's, there's no value in it. So therefore, there's no inherent need for 98% I would argue with you that looking at the history of civilization under the male species, yeah, I, yeah. I would love it if post-carbon society means no more war. I have a hard time finding, believing that men won't find reasons well, that's to fine. start well, wars anyway. I agree with you too, but we don't have time to split that hair. We have to get out of the street and end this whole structure that we're looking at and start a rebuilding of the world around a non-carbon economy. I mean, any little way, but every big way you can. And, and you know, that, this, is, this is the headline. Nothing in today's headlines compares to the coming catastrophe. 
Nothing. I mean, every day I see that headline. And we sit here going, oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, we're not sitting here going, oh yeah, yeah. Probably everybody. No, we're here. Protest. We've been we're out here. on the streets, been part of organization. Right. My question is, you know, what we're talking about here, quite rightly, is taking on the home ruling class. Right. You know, the owners of the Absolutely. oil companies, and gas companies, right. and everything else, the people who benefit from the way things are. Right. But now the streets ain't going to change that. Well, we've got to come up with some better. You know, again, let's, let's think about Russia and the Soviet Union. It fell because um, people's financial ability to survive, because people's... Right, the, but that's not true here. Man. Well, it's true, and not, not that much, but it's increasingly true. It's and, true enough. And as we get to the, as we get, you know, I mean, it's not going to happen tomorrow. And obviously what Trump is doing is he pushes all the buttons so that we are at a more and more cataclysmic moment. It's no telling what will happen between here and November of 2020. <laughs> Lots will, that's all we know, Lots will. Mm -hmm. And so I think we, we really need to do what we already are doing. Yeah. And, and then, I but think have bigger, you have to think more. And we're, right, it's the convincing right. enough of us to think bigger. Right. I don't see it happening, even with this great anti-government feeling because of Trump being in office, most people just want to have done with Trump and go back to somebody like Joe Biden. <coughs> well, that's what we read in the New York Times. That I know where no, they but I go. think it's true. Uh, it's, I don't, it I is don't. my impression. Well, no, I, you know, I think we need to start. I mean, that's not true in the high schools. That's yeah. not true. In, oh, well, that's, that's good. You know, mm -hmm. um, okay. The youth are, are they are where they're, they're you know Greta Greta Thunberg and and, and and the you know and the Sunrise Movement. I don't know how many people are familiar with the Sunrise Movement, but that's the youth movement for climate emergency in the United States right now, and they're and they're doing it. I mean, they're marching all over this nation. <laughs> So uh, there are avenues um, into which we can, you know, put ourselves that I think are thinking on a bigger scale. And I think it's, you know, what we can bring as, as, as what's the word, you know, elders, uh, <laughs> is, uh, is uh, a sense that thinking big is, is a, worthy, a worthy idea, and, you know, and, and giving, uh, Giving confidence that that's where what has to happen. You know, the, 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 we have to be able to change this structure in five years. To really start dismembering it completely and rebuilding on a basis with a, a carbon-less economy. Period. Just period. And, and nothing else matters. And when that's the point, then all these other things will fall away. All the, the secret services and the, and the all that stuff just will have no point because it won't be where humans are going. And if we don't do it, then we're very soon going to see these catastrophes that make today's headlines look like tea parties. How are you running for this on saving? Mm -hmm. Say again? It's not getting more space. The government is running for president this whole issue. In, I, which, I mean, you know. Um, oh, there's only one guy that's completely. Yeah. Well, Bernie Sanders is the one who stood up in 2016 and said climate change is the biggest threat facing America. Right. So he's been saying this for five years. Um, so it, it's not, it's, it, if we keep watching TV and reading the New York Times and pretending that's what the people are thinking, we're making a big mistake. I'm making a Because the media wants you to think that, so that's not good. You know, why is Ronald Reagan popular still? Because of what they crafted. Even though he's one of the most evil entities that ever walked the face of America. And you know, he, you know, he's being compared. I mean, but when you look at how many people died of murders, tortures, innocent deaths under Ronald Reagan, only Nixon comes close. Which is pretty good too. Well, yeah, yeah, he did pretty well with the rap. Yeah. 
So it's, you know, from that interesting perspective, Trump hasn't done, hasn't measured up. He's messed with our heads, but he hasn't slaughtered uh, the way the others do. Right. That's, that's, that's a funny, indirect um, kind of positive indice. Um, but, you know, here we are. So I think we have to stop pretending that the rules are going to be as they have been, because they aren't. And we have to move into, so go out and find out about the Sunrise Movement, when Greta is coming to Vermont, these kinds of things, and then start and go to the high school and talk to the youth. And say, they're much more ready to change than, than we are. Thank you. Thank you. 